In the year 2508, humanity has spread itself amongst the stars, colonizing and harvesting the riches of the cosmos. Yet this brave venture into the final frontier was not a valiant next step, but a last-ditch effort to avoid extinction. Years of consumption had led to shortages of every major resource, leaving no choice but to look to other worlds for the resources needed to survive. This led to the creation of massive mining vessels known as Planet Crackers. Built to break apart barren worlds and harvest the precious materials within, by using Planet Cracking, humanity managed to narrowly avoid catastrophe and instead ushered in a new golden age of discovery, technological innovation and prosperity. However, humanity's hubris led them to believe that no danger could arise from exploring the deepest regions of unknown space in their endless search for resources. That was a mistake that humanity would pay dearly for, a mistake that would once again bring about the threat of total annihilation of the human race. We will begin our analysis of the creatures known as necromorphs, with the relevant history surrounding their creation and purpose, followed by an in-depth physical analysis of their many forms and concluding with the best-known strategies for combating these vicious creatures. To begin to understand the creation of the necromorphs, one must learn the history of cosmic entities known as Brethren Moons. The Brethren Moons are an ancient species of moon-sized necrotic life forms on a relentless quest to consume all organic life across the universe. This ceaseless crusade against biological existence spans countless centuries, resulting in entire star systems devoid of even the most basic microbial life. While their ultimate goal is reproduction, the moons perceive their existence and mission as divine and inevitable considering themselves akin to gods orchestrating the ascension of species through eradication. Additionally, they exhibit a seemingly religious reverence for death. In order to consume biomass across the universe, the Brethren Moons form a double helix-shaped obelisk known as a marker. Black markers are generated within the moons, which are subsequently ejected to travel through space at sublight speeds until impacting a suitable host world. On Earth, for instance, a black marker arrived within an asteroid, colliding with the Yucatan Peninsula about 65 million years ago, leading to the extinction of dinosaurs. There are many who believe that the presence of markers strongly influences the evolution of sentient life forms in a productive manner over time, increasing the growth of intellectual capacity in the dominant life form. Once a host world is reached, the black marker lies dormant activating only when the dominant life form achieves a certain technological advancement. The marker then emits an electromagnetic signal affecting intelligent beings, causing aggressive tendencies in simpler minds and compelling intellectuals to replicate the markers through artificial means. The artificially replicated form is known as a red marker. Initially appearing as a seemingly boundless source of electromagnetic energy, intelligent species will begin to build more of the markers to sustain their growing population's energy needs, unaware that they are also being subtly influenced by the marker to continue such actions. The psychological effect known as marker dementia will be spreading rapidly at this point, causing violence on a mass scale, the purpose of which is to generate a large enough mass of necrotic tissue near the markers, once a sufficient level of corpses are available, a dormant function within the marker will activate after a brief period, altering necrotic tissue at the molecular level, reanimating corpses into the beings known as necromorphs. These relentless biorecombinant creatures spread like a pandemic across the affected planet's surface, making containment nearly impossible due to the widespread presence of markers that would have been strategically placed in major population centers. This mass hysteria is often further aided by cults formed around the worship of the markers. In humanity's case, a group known as Unitologists serve this role. A 
Upon the death of a host who has been influenced by the marker, the recombinant properties of the infection take hold rapidly and violently. Cellular functions go into a self-destructive overdrive, generating biologically active compounds metabolized by reanimated flesh to fuel further mutations. Bones are broken, assembled into new configurations, or reshaped entirely. The transformation occurs within seconds, generating intense heat. Often the spasming corpses become so hot that stagnant blood boils in veins and arteries, rupturing the skin. Unnecessary vital organs, such as parts of the digestive system, are broken down and repurposed into additional musculature, providing increased physical strength to all necromorphs. A common change is also the reconstitution of bone matter into razor-sharp blades or spikes to be used in close-range attacks. Necromorphs exhibit highly aggressive behavior attacking any living being on site without discrimination across species. This aggression stems from their primary objective of killing new hosts and rapidly spreading the infection. To enhance their hunting efficiency, necromorphs possess a collective intelligence facilitated by nexus necromorphs or hive minds acting as conduits for marker signals. These large creatures relay orders to smaller necromorphs, although the markers do not directly guide the creatures beyond issuing general commands to the nexus forms. Consequently, Necromorphs act as quasi-animals with an insatiable drive to hunt and gather biomass, even attacking individuals influenced by the marker. Although they are generally perceived as mindless killing machines, necromorphs occasionally display tactical planning and cooperative behavior. They commonly form small packs with mixed individuals and specific roles, utilizing stealth, ambushes or group tactics to outsmart their victims. This behavior implies a degree of strategic thinking, individual intelligence, and communication. Examples include using ventilation shafts for stealthy approaches, playing dead, waiting until victims are within striking range or have their backs turned, and using lures to draw known threats into ambushes. Necromorphs not actively engaging non-necromorph targets exhibit various behaviors. Some wander aimlessly until detecting a new victim immediately engaging upon awareness. Others relocate bodies, potentially to aid infectors in finding them. Some hide in ventilation shafts, setting up ambush sites, while others stand in place, awaiting new victims. When a target is present but out of range, they observe and attempt intimidation with growls and threatening poses. All necromorphs exhibit remarkable resilience, allowing them to thrive in inhospitable environments like the vacuum of space. This resilience suggests a complete absence of respiration or reliance on vascular activity, which accounts for their resistance to injuries that would lead to severe blood loss through hemorrhaging in humans. The most efficient method to overcome the majority of necromorph forms is through dismemberment. By severing a necromorph's means of mobility, the creature collapses and appears inert. However, even in this state, the marker signal persists, subtly altering their structure and keeping their cells alive. Because there is an incredibly vast variety of necromorph forms that have been discovered, and potentially infinite forms due to taking on various characteristics of the host's body, we will only be discussing a few of the most common forms encountered in a typical human outbreak. Slashes stand as the most prevalent type of necromorphs. While individually weak and possessing sluggish reflexes, Slashers become a formidable threat when in groups. Originating from a single human corpse, slashers are commonly encountered during typical outbreaks. Their name is derived from specialized arms adorned with sharp, blade-like protrusions of bone. These arms may either be alterations of the host's original limbs or entirely new appendages emerging from the shoulder blades or a mass of flesh at the back. The primary purpose of these blades is to serve as the slasher's main weapon capable of easily dismembering most victims, complementing the creature's raw strength. Apart from their bladed limbs, slashers feature a lower set of arms. In some cases, these appear to be the host's original arms secured to the sides of the body or mutated intestines, while in others, they manifest as spindly vestigial limbs emerging from the exposed abdominal cavity. These lower limbs contribute to stability enabling the slasher to attack victims with its claws without toppling over 
when the lower limbs are lost. Although these limbs are relatively weak, they are occasionally used to restrain struggling victims. The feet also undergo modifications, with fused and lengthened bones and an extended heel bone forming a sharp peg for balance. While this adapted foot aids rapid crawling and running, it results in an unstable gait during walking, making it challenging for slashers to maintain balance without constant movement of their slashing limbs as counterweights. Slashers emit different noises depending on their situation, allowing for identification of specific actions. Unnoticed slashers produce periodic gurgling and choking sounds, also present when sneaking behind unsuspecting victims. Upon spotting potential prey, these sounds intensify with menacing bellows and roars. When engaging in a charge, this necromorph will let out a menacing, inhuman scream. Recognizing these noises helps identify a slasher's status before visual confirmation, enabling individuals to respond effectively. Each slasher type possesses a distinct set of sounds, providing valuable cues for identifying the specific form encountered. Another common form is the stalker, a necromorph specializing in flanking and group tactics, which employs a stealthy and deliberate approach to prey. Moving slowly and quietly, they aim to avoid detection, making it challenging for their victims to notice their gradual approach. Stalkers undergo extensive alterations, bearing minimal resemblance to their host's original form. Their elongated arms feature extended talons with sharpened tips, capable of impaling, knocking down and rending victims. The ribcage is prominently displayed, devoid of digestive organs and featuring only vestigial remnants of once vital organs. Distinct musculature in the back reinforces the spinal column and neck, leading to the stalker's most defining feature, a massive, eyeless, three-pronged head with traces of the host's bone structure. The skull, largely exposed, is equipped with a thick cap adorned with bony protrusions for crushing and bashing. The upper jaw and nasal cavities remain relatively intact, while the cranial dome is flattened to provide an even durable striking surface, supported by cheekbones. Remarkably, this highly mutated skull is the creature's most resilient point, immune to dismemberment. The legs undergo significant transformation, adopting a digitigrade structure and terminating in two slender digits. Regarded as among the most intelligent and opportunistic common necromorphs, stalkers collaborate in groups to distract and flank their prey. They navigate between hiding spots, peek from cover, and attempt to lure victims into exposed areas. During an attack, they charge with a high-pitched screech, limbs tucked for protection and streamlining. Stalkers coordinate attacks, taking turns to strike when victims let their guard down, then swiftly retreating before any counteraction. A form often spotted far too late is known as the leaper. Leapers appear to be made from a single human corpse, with the host body's modifications serving to give the necromorph vastly increased mobility. The musculature of the upper arm becomes more developed, and the fingers grow bladed claws for climbing and slashing, with the hands becoming dislocated, along with the thumbs moved to the back to create animal-like paws. There is a slight lengthening of the vertebral ridges and the flexibility of the spinal column is increased to help in locomotion. The legs are completely reshaped. The muscle and bone is flayed, fused together and lengthened into a single limb tipped with a sharp blade of considerable weight and durability. This tail is highly flexible, able to contract and coil into about a third of its original length. The leaper uses its powerful tail to quickly launch the creature toward its victims or uses it to stab into its enemies. The cranial and sinus areas of the skull appear to have been disarticulated from the neck and the jaws have become heavily mutated. The upper sets of teeth are completely gone, along with most of the palate reaching back into the throat. In their place is a pair of multi-jointed appendages that bear sharp, bony fangs. The lower jaw is split into two curved mandibles, ending in knife-like fangs. Exploders are necromorph forms that serve the sole purpose of using a specialized pustule on their body to create a powerful organic detonation when near potential targets. The pustule seems to be filled with the same yellow bile as found on other forms. 
but in a much higher quantity, resulting in a remarkably powerful explosion when pierced. The exploder seems to be aware of this function as they are known to charge enemies in an attempt to cause a detonation, destroying themselves and the victim. The cranium of the exploder is split open vertically, with the brain cavity being filled with connective tissue that allows the two halves of the head to serve as jaws. The left arm of the creature has become stiff, no longer having any articulation points except for the shoulder. The pustule has developed at the arm's end, making it very heavy and unwieldy. To counter the weight of the left arm, the exploder's right arm and legs have been transformed in a way that moves the creature's center of mass away from the massive pustule, thus allowing the exploder to walk, albeit very clumsily. The right forearm has been extensively modified with the right hand and foot fused together and extended in order to act as a leg, while the original legs and left foot have become fused and twisted to form a single muscular limb. Although exploders move sluggishly in general, they are capable of displaying surprising bursts of speed after they have closed the distance between themselves and their intended targets. Once an exploder is within striking range, it will swing its pustule into its victim or the ground, resulting in a deadly explosion for anything caught in the blast radius. Due to their single-use attack and relatively slow movement, they often attack in large groups in an attempt to overwhelm their target. Their presence can be easily detected by the distinctive cackling sounds they make when they are in the vicinity. The necromorph form that presents the greatest threat is undoubtedly the infector. Formed from a human torso and legs, the infector's wings are formed by a flap of skin from the chest and then fused between the former host's bent and broken legs. The jaw collapses within the body and the rest of the head breaks and twists into its proboscis and feelers with the spine providing support and attachment points for articulation. The proboscis which is made from mutated bone muscle and spinal tissue, is the delivery mechanism for the pure necromorph tissue used to infect new hosts. This is done by enveloping the host in its wings, extending the proboscis from the spinal cavity, and then stabbing it into the skull to inject a yellow fluid stored internally. Infectors are often among the first to be generated by the markers after an outbreak begins, as they are capable of facilitating a rapid growth of the necromorph population by directly infecting corpses and even living beings. In the nightmarish reality of a necromorph-infested world, where life and death are twisted into grotesque amalgamations, your survival will constantly hang by a thread. In facing the necromorph onslaught, the importance of strategic dismemberment cannot be overstated. These grotesque entities are most effectively neutralized by severing their limbs. Weapons that are capable of making precision cuts cleanly through organic tissue are highly advised, as normal ballistics will have little to no effect on most necrotic forms. Navigating a necromorph-infested environment requires an acute awareness of your surroundings. The darkness conceals unseen threats, and the judicious use of a reliable light source may become your only beacon of safety. Illuminate dark corners, peer into crevices, and be prepared for the unexpected ambushes that may lie in wait, as these hiding holes will likely need to be cleared before moving on. Once the initial outbreak has been allowed to run its course, and the increasing biomass of the necromorphs begins to slow, the next and paramount objective will be to disable the marker. Without disabling the marker, any efforts to contain the outbreak will be in vain, as it is capable of indefinitely reanimating necrotic flesh to use in its designs. If allowed to continue uninterrupted, the marker will complete convergence and facilitate the birth of a brethren moon. The cost of this event would result in incalculable loss of life not to mention the virtual destruction of the entire planet. This outcome must be avoided at any and all costs. Destroying a marker will be no easy feat, however, 
The sheer physical scale and structural integrity of these markers is of a design far more complex than most human structures. Red and black markers are known to be anywhere from tens of meters tall to a size that would dwarf most of humanity's largest terrestrial structures. This being said, a brute force attack is not advisable. If no other option is available, using a significantly powerful enough explosion will destroy the marker through structural failure. But it is imperative to note that this will not permanently disable the marker's capabilities, as the remaining shards can still be used in the rebuilding of another red marker, and limited effects may continue. As far as permanently disabling markers goes, there is little data to support one effective method above all others. Marker 3A, for example, was largely rendered ineffective after the Ishimura's gravity tethers were disabled in orbit, resulting in a massive tectonic plate being dropped on the marker site. Yet curiously, the Site 12 marker was disabled in a psychic battle between it and engineer Isaac Clarke. After realizing the extent of which the marker had been influencing his actions, Clark engaged the marker, or presumably the voice of the Brethren Moons, within his mind, seeking to destroy the areas of influence the marker held within himself. After emerging victorious, the marker appeared to begin to collapse from some form of structural damage. The specifics of this event are still left largely unexplained. Clark's specific role in this event likely bears some importance, as he had long been considered a special architect by the marker. Whether this internal classification by the marker or Clark's exceptional mental fortitude was the contingent factor in his success may forever remain a mystery. In summary, necromorphs are a deadly and rapidly evolving enemy, literally and figuratively. As such, they should be dealt with using extreme caution, as they are only the symptom of the greater disease that is the markers and the cosmic entities known as Brethren Moons.